from New York, where the American stage begins, NBC presents Best Plays with John Chapman. dramas selected from the outstanding successes of the New York stage. Now, John Chapman, editor of the theatrical yearbook Best Plays and drama critic of the New York Daily News, is here to introduce Richard Basehart in Sidney Kingsley's Men in White. <laughs> Mr. Chapman. Our play this evening is Men in White by Sidney Kingsley. And I'd go so far as to call Mr. Kingsley a distinguished dramatist. Certainly, he has gained enough distinction, what with the Pulitzer Prize, two Critics Circle Awards, and numerous other literary honors. Men in White was Kingsley's first play. Its success was so great that it inspired a practically unending series of hospital dramas in the movies and on the radio, some of which, unhappily, have been terrible. One word of caution, however... Men in White was produced 20 years ago. Its clinical realism was completely accurate then, as witnessed the fact that it won the Pulitzer Prize. But since that time, two decades of rapid medical progress have taken place, and many of the things that you will hear in this drama, while true when they were written, are no longer true today. But we are proud of this play. It is an adult play with an adult theme that has become a true milestone of the American theater. Our leading actor this evening is Richard Basehart, who won real recognition in the Hasty Heart on Broadway, playing the young Scottish warrior in a jungle hospital. Hollywood took him from there, and Basehart has appeared in a number of good films, including The House on Telegraph Hill and 14 Hours. Now, for this evening, we are taking Basehart from Hollywood to play Men in White. And here is the curtain for Act One. I swear by Apollo, the physician, and Esculapius, and Hygieia, and Panacea, I will carry out regimen for the benefit of the sick, and I will keep them from harm and wrong. Into whatsoever houses I shall enter, I will work for the benefit of the sick, holding aloof from all voluntary wrong and corruption. And now, if I shall fulfill this oath and break it not, may the fruits of art and life be mine. May I be honored of all men for all time. The opposite if I transgress and be forsworn. The oath of Hippocrates, the physician, sworn by the men of medicine from ancient Greece through the centuries and still used today. St. George's Hospital on the corner of 3rd Avenue and 24th Street. The original building of sandstone and brick was built in 1895. The new wing was added in 1905 on the death of Horace Livingston, original chairman of the board of trustees, who left the bulk of a fortune based on Nevada copper to St. George's in endowment. Architects' plans for an added maternity wing, tuberculosis center, and outpatient clinics gather dust in the files of the board. The year is 1933, the time of the Depression. Dr. Hopper, Dr. Vitale, Dr. Rand. The halls are crowded in St. George. During visiting hours, sad-faced relatives and anxious husbands and wives fill the lobby and press into the wards as the hands hit 2.30. The sensible heels of the nurses click on the linoleum floors. Their caps are varied. The frilly Dixie cup of the St. Luke's nursing school, the broad white of Mount Sinai, with the white and black stripe of the St. George school predominating. Morning, Dr. Hochberg. Good morning, Miss Rand. How is that post-operative in B-Ward? All critical. Good, good. The doctors pass quickly through the halls. Interns and housemen in unpressed baggy whites, a stethoscope stuffed in the back pocket. The life of the hospital. Dr. Otis, Dr. Taylor, Dr. Groves, Dr. Through that door is the hospital library. An oasis of relaxation, overstuffed chairs and backdate professional journals. Oh, uh, Dr. Hartworth. Uh, I've been waiting for you. Hello, Josh. There's a patient I want you to see. Uh, we'll look at him in a minute. 
Uh, George Ferguson isn't here, is he? Shall I call him, Dr. Hartberg? Uh, please, Mike. <laughs> My eyes are bothering me. Trying to read all this new medical literature certainly keeps piling up. How can these young men ever keep up? They manage. Uh, there's so much. In my father's time, appendicitis was a fatal disease. Today, it's nothing. These youngsters take all that for granted. They work. Good men in medicine will always have work. We use a steak and to my room. I could take them up to the OR and divide all that dead tissue. Oh, excuse me, doctor. Did you want me, Dr. Hockman? Uh, yes, Ferguson. How is 217? It's pretty restless during the night, but her temperature's down to normal now. Good, good. And uh, Ward B, Petri? Fine. As for a drink of whiskey. <laughs> he will be all right. He is all right. I gave him a drink. It won't hurt him. Uh, by the way, George, they're sending Mr. Hudson home Tuesday. Tuesday? Say, that's great. Uh, does Laura know yet? I phoned her this morning. I wish you'd let me tell her. I should have thought of that. She yeah, happy? Uh, Naturally. For you, George. Oh, excuse me. Uh, excuse me, Doctor. Uh, what? Uh, it, it's Dr. Levine. I, I didn't recognize you. Yes, I know. Uh, Dr. Gordon, you remember Dr. Levine. Uh, oh. Why, of course. Where have you been, Levine? Must be five years. Uh, six. Six? My. Nothing much changes in the hospital, eh? Only people, we change, we get old, break up so quickly. Well, uh, I've got a look at that boy in 401. Uh, glad to have seen you again, Dr. Levine. Thank you. Dr. Medicine, Dr. Well, Levine. How are things with you? Oh, uh, getting along, Doctor. How is Catherine? Not so well. She uh, she has a slight persistent cough. Uh, her lungs. Uh, I have some x-rays here. Hmm. Uh, George. Yes, Doctor. Look at these. That shadow there, right apex? Uh, yes, uh, I was afraid that... Have you examined the sputum? I brought a specimen. <laughs> My microscope is broken. We will look at it for you. I'll have the path lab check up on this. Serious case? My wife. Oh. Uh, Dr. Ferguson, uh, Dr. Levine. Well, how do you do? How do you do? I'll have the report tonight. Uh, drop into my room, 106. 106? That's my old room. You interned here? Oh, of course. Bellevue, aren't you? He's 23. Professor Drury mentions you quite often. Oh, he still remembers me. He thinks a great deal of you. George here is one of his prized pupils, too. And does he want you to study abroad? I'm going to study on the, uh, von, von Einzelberg in Vienna. I'm sort of uh, combining it with a honeymoon. You'll find it hard mixing the two. I know von Eiselberg. Uh, he'll have a fight. You don't know Laura. <laughs> anyway, the real work won't start till I get back. I'm working for a year with Dr. Hartberg. And believe me, I will drive you, George, with a whip. <laughs> <laughs> You're lucky. Uh, I once looked forward to that. Remember, there's only one Hartberg. Every minute with him is precious. Well, uh... You'll excuse me now. I... I'll have that report this evening, Dr. Levine. Thank you. Come along, Levine. Uh, tell me everything that has happened to you. Excuse me. Sure, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Ferguson. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. That drink worked wonders. Bed tree sitting up and taking notice. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new school of therapy. Hey, Ryan. You're not looking so hot. You ought to stay home one night, get some sleep. I'm doing all right. I'll bet you are. Ryan's all right, huh? I don't suppose so. You got a lot of that redhead on pediatrics? I didn't know this. Well, that's the trouble with being in love. You know, I was in love once myself. But when it began to interfere with my appetite, well, no woman's worth that. Pete, did you check that little girl we operated on? <laughs> yeah, coming out of Ethan nicely. I was kind of worried about that pre-op, insulin. How much you give her? Forty units. Twenty would have been enough. I know. Well, why forty, then? You might have hurt the kid. Dr. Cunningham ordered it. He's the attending physician. That ignoramus. Look, if that happens again, tell me. I don't want any shock on the operating table. Oh, uh, Ferguson, <coughs> I just saw 401. You may need another transfusion. 401? <laughs> You'll have to go pretty deep to find a good vein. Well, that's what I'm worried about. I want you to be there to do it. Tonight? I'm sorry, Ferguson. When the house needs you... Well, I'd like to, Doctor, but the same thing happened last week. But this is my night out. My fiancé's made arrangements. Uh, Dr. Gordon, couldn't I do that transfusion? I'm afraid not, Michelson. The superficial veins are thrombosis. Uh, Ferguson knows the veins we've used. If I disappoint my fiancé once more, I won't have one. Well, I don't like to impose, but I want this boy to have every chance. Well, doctor? All right, I'll stay. Thanks. And if your sweetheart kicks, send her around to me. I'll tell her about my wife. 
Up at 4.30 this morning to answer the phone. Somebody had a belly. How do you like that? Haven't had a night with Laura since... Uh, not tough, George. Laura's going to be real hurt. You'd think they'd have enough... Dr. Ferguson, a woman just came into emergency with a lacerated throat. She's bleeding terribly. They can't stop it. Well, get her up to the operating room. Uh, Pete, order, an, order the OR. Get anesthesia. Yeah. Ryan, locate Dr. Hartberg. Uh, try the x-ray room. Right. Uh, operating room. Find Dr. Hartberg right away. Oh, our secretary is taking care of the waiting invitations. Better get your list to her. I still can't believe it's happening. <laughs> Vienna's going to be lots of fun. When have you seen the Prater? It's like, like Coney Island with a, with a lift. And the whole place tinkling with music. When I was with von Eiselberg in Vienna, his students spent all their time working. That is what George's Vienna is going to be, Laura. Don't you listen to that old fogey. <laughs> You kids enjoy yourself. Hartberg, wheel me out to the sun deck. Since when are you so interested in heliotherapy? Hockey. All right. Let's go, John. I'll call you when I want you. Sweetheart. How's my boy? Laura, you're lovely. Oh, George. If you knew how I've been aching for you. Laura... You're getting thin, young man, and your eyes are tired. Oh, I didn't have much sleep last night. It was a pretty sick house. You're overworked. You know, you've spoiled things for me. I don't get any kick unless you're around. And that's not often, is it? Hey, darling, we'll make up for it all later on, honestly. I don't know if we can, George. If you're not there, it's just gone. Laura, I don't know how to explain, but... About seven months ago, we operated on a boy here who was blind from birth. And one night I showed him the stars. He looked and, and he began to cry. I feel that way, Laura, when I look at you. I, I can't tell you Dr. how... Dr. Ferguson! Dr. Ferguson! Uh, don't move. It's no use, Laura. That's my call. Uh, Dr. Ferguson. Yes? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll be ready. All right, go on. Go to work. I won't be needed for a half hour yet. <laughs> well, I have to go get my hair done for tonight. Uh, Laura, dear. And what a night we're going to have. All by ourselves. We can take the car. Uh, we... Laura, you won't be upset, will you? Hmm? Why? I can't make it tonight. I've got to stay in. Oh, George, again? I tried to duck out, but there's a transfusion I have to do. Well, and... I'll wait. Uh, you better not. It depends on the patient. I, I just got to be around and ready. Oh. Well, George, it isn't fair. I don't mind so much for myself. Oh, well, I do. Oh, George, what's our life going to be like? I could strangle Gordon. Michelson could have done that transfusion. George, I, I know this is important to you, but when we get back, let's arrange our lives like, like human beings. You can open up an office and have regular hours. If I work with Hartberg, darling, I won't have the time to practice. Well, that's just it. I'll never see you. But, Laura, I've, I've plugged all my life just hoping that someday a man like Hawk... Burton... George, I, I couldn't go on this way. I, I'd rather break off now and try to forget you. Laura, don't ever say a thing like that. Oh, listen, darling. Dr. Ferguson. Dr. Ferguson. They're calling you. I know. Laura. Dr. Ferguson. Dr. Ferguson. Dr. Ferguson. Yes? Who? South 218. Well, call Dr. Cunningham. It's his case. When? Well, what's the temperature? The pulse? Is she pale, perspiring? Did she ask for food before she became unconscious? No, no more insulin. Absolutely. I'll be right down. I have to go now, Laura. Uh, please, don't worry. George. Laura, things will straighten out. No, they won't. I'll see you tomorrow night. We have to come to some decision. Laura, please. I mean it, absolutely. All right. South 218, the children's ward. One bed screened off. The patient, ten years old, eyes closed, skin pale, clammy. South 218, calling Dr. It's an emergency. Why isn't he here? Get Dr. Ferguson. I don't know. Dr. Cunningham, thank heaven you're here. Now, now, what's happened to you? A complete collapse about two minutes ago. Let's have a look. Mm. 
Huh? Let's have my set of books. Pops is barely... Diabetic coma. Miss um, uh, Denning, prepare some insulin. 40 units with uh, 50 grams of glucose. But, sir, Dr. Ferguson advised against... Ferguson, it. this is my patient. 40 units, quick. Yes, doctor. No, it's... Uh, oh, doctor, I was afraid of shock. This isn't shock, it's diabetic coma. With a temperature subnormal? Yes. Nurse, is that insulin ready yet? Uh, doctor, isn't insulin contraindicated here? No, it's our last chance. Hypodermic, doctor. Doctor, I, I mean no offense, but it looks like shock, not cold. No, no. Alcohol. But, but the clinical picture, pale, cold, clammy, temperature subnormal. She's complained of hunger. Suppose you let me handle this case, young man. A nurse, prepare the arm. Please, doctor, call in one or the other men. Ask them, anybody. There's no time. Take your hand off. That insulin is going to prove fatal. Fatal? Get out of here, will you? I'm treating my patient. Give me that hypo. Uh, what are you... You fool, you dropped it. Nurse, shock position. Go ahead, ele elevate that bed. Yes, doctor. What, what the devil? Out of my way. Nurse. Yes, sir. Sterile blue case, quick. 30 cc syringe. There's some glucose here, sir. How much? 50 grams. Half of that. Apply a tourniquet, right arm. Yes, sir. Never mind the glucose. Uh, hypo of adrenaline. Get some hot packs, blankets. Well, come on now, hurry. Is your arm ready? What do you think you're doing? I'll have you brought up before the medical board. I'll have you thrown out of the hospital. All right, have me thrown out. I don't care. I don't really care. Pardon me. Ready, sir. Let me have that glucose. Swab the arm. Never mind the iodine. Hmm. A good vein. You pay for this, young man. That patient's life is on your hands. Adrenaline, doctor. Here we are. Well, that's about all we can do. You report downstairs at once. Watch him. Dr. Ferguson? Quiet. Dr. George. Yes, Dorothy. I'm thirsty. I want a drink. <laughs> you good, sweetheart. What a... Here you are, darling. I feel so funny, Dr. George. Did you like? What happened? Nothing. You fell asleep. That's all. All right, honey. Drink this now. All of it. Okay. I ought to report you, of course, meddling young puppy, but under the circumstances, I guess I can be lenient this time. But if you ever dare interfere in one of my cases again, order a blood sugar. If there are any new developments, phone my secretary at once. Yes, sir. Well, he's all right now. I can go. Yes, sir. She's almost asleep. What's he going to do? Nothing. She's a pretty kid, isn't she? I was scared we were going to lose her. I think it was wonderful for you to stand up against Dr. Cunningham. Uh, well. Clean up that hypo, nurse. Yes, sir. What's the matter with you? This is the first time I was on the children's ward. I'm only a student. I mean, of course, you know, but... I got to like Dottie an awful lot. I see. What's your name? Barbara Dennis. You're going to be a swell nurse, Barbara. Thanks. Sometimes I'm not so sure. You take my advice. You get as far away from here tonight as you can. Have a good time. Relax. Forget about the hospital. I can't. I have an exam in Materia Medica tomorrow. Huh? I think I've got some notes on that that may help you. I'll leave them with the orderly on the first floor. Thanks. Dr. Ferguson. Dr. Ferguson. All right, I'm coming. Outside wire. Atwater nine double oh three two. Hello. Hello, Laura. How are you, dear? You feeling better? 
Well, look, uh, look, I can make it tonight after all. The patient, uh, well, they, they won't need me. Oh, but, darling, let's not go into that. But listen, Laura, the, the chance to work with Hockberg is one of the best breaks I've ever had. You don't expect me to throw it over at a moment's notice because you have some crazy idea. No, no, I, I don't want to talk about it. I'm tired of three operations and... I can't make decisions tonight in a minute. Laura, what are you doing? Punishing me? All right, I'll see you tomorrow night. Goodbye. I'm sorry if I... Uh... Oh, Dr. Levine, come in. Well, it hasn't changed. The room, I mean, like yesterday. Uh... That report... Uh, I just called about it. It's coming down. Poor Catherine. She's had so much. Things were different when I was here. Levine, that fool, they said he had a chance to work with Hochberg, and he turned it down for a pretty girl. Poor Catherine. It's tough for doctors these days. Look at me. Uh, Fifty cents a patient. Tenements. Why do we kill ourselves for it? Well, my dad used to say, above all, humanity. He was a fine man. Small town position upstate. When I was about 13, he came to my room one night and apologized because he was going to die. His heart had gone bad on him. He knew if he gave up medicine and took it easy, he could live for 20 years, but he wouldn't. Above all else, humanity. Not good, too much suffering. Killed something in you. A doctor shouldn't have to worry about money. That's one disease he's not trained to fight. It either corrupts him or it destroys him. We can't let outside things or people interfere with us. We can't. Even if we have to tear out our hearts to do it. <laughs> Sorry, it's something personal. Yes? Now, Finn sent this down from pathology. Oh, thanks, Pete. Well, this is it, all right. What? What is it? It's been checked. I knew it. I knew. Tuberculosis. Poor Catherine. Sit down, Doctor. She'll come through. Maybe. Maybe. That means giving up what little practice I have and starting all over again. I I don't know if we can do it. We're not young any longer. I don't know. Well, got to go. Is there anything I can do? No, thanks. Thanks. Hey, George, you free? Oh, I want a roast beef sandwich. I just had a flashes. Got a toothpick? Oh, never mind. Hey, you know that Miss Simpson in X-ray? She was down, all dressed up in street clothes. I never seen her without that lab coat. Man, what she's hiding. Ah. Hey, Pete, I want to do some reading. Will you get out of here? Oh, sure, sure. Sorry. Come in. Um, I came down for those notes. Oh. I forgot to leave them, didn't I? Uh, what was it? Materia Medica? Yes. Uh, have them here someplace. Well, I oughtn't to have come in. The pathology, histology. I hope nobody saw me. Uh, Materia Medica, here. Here you are. Thanks. I uh, hope they help you. Is there anything wrong? No. No. Oh. Well, I'd, I'd better... Thanks. Oh. What is it? Head nurse outside. Oh, wait here. She'll be gone in a minute. Sit down. Thanks. You know, if Dr. Cunningham said anything, I'd go right down and tell him the whole truth. Uh, it's not Cunningham. What is it, then? Something's wrong. You work very hard, don't you? Work? Sure. What else is there but work? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see if there's not. If you memorize this outline, you've got it all... You know, when I thought Dottie was going to die, I got the feeling like... 
Can't put it into words. No, no. I, I know that feeling. You too? And me too, up to here, Barbara. I'm tired of work and blood and sweat and pain. That man in 341 is dead. Levine's wife is going to die. You begin to wonder what it's all about. Does it, does it make any difference? It's so lonely. And you feel tomorrow it's me. The only thing that matters is being alive now, isn't it? Your students have a pretty tough time of it, don't you? Grind all day. Lights out at 10 o'clock. One night out till 12.30. I haven't taken mine in two months. There's just nobody... You're a very sweet girl, Barbara. I'm sorry. Uh, this uh, page covers, covers the whole field. Uh, the diagrams over here and... Uh... Look, please don't feel that I, I just... No. Oh, no. Thanks. I'm going up to Ward C and look around for three seconds, sir. You better go now before I get back. moment, Act Two of Men in White, starring Richard Basehart, with Patricia Wheel and Santos Ortega. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. KFI Los Angeles. Michael Redgrave and Edna Best star this evening as Theater Guild on the Air opens a new year of radio entertainment with S.N. Berman's recent Broadway comedy hit, Jane. Miss Best will recreate her original title role. Be sure to hear Jane this evening at 5.30 on KFI, your NBC station in Los Angeles. Now, Act Two of the Best Plays production of Men in White, starring Richard Basehart as Dr. Ferguson, with Patricia Wheel as Laura and Santos Ortega as Dr. Hochberg. Here again is John Chapman. Let's return now to the year 1933 and to that imposing structure on the corner of 3rd Avenue and 24th Street, which we call St. George's Hospital. temperature and the pulse rate are not the only mathematics at St. George's Hospital. 28,000, 19,000, 35,500. St. George's is governed by the Joint Committee, representing the Lay Board and the Medical Board. The final authority being, as is usually the case, not with the men who carry the stethoscope, but rather those armed with the textbook. Adding up to a total deficit of $163,000 so far. You'll have to cut expenses, doctors. Oh, but we have cut to the bone already. Interns are allowed only two outside telephone calls a month. An absurd economy. The board of trustees, uh, well, uh, two of our trustees, lost everything they had in the bank figures last year. They won't be able to meet their usual subscription this year. I've been looking around for a new trustee. I finally found one. Oh, wonderful. Who stands ready to underwrite our deficit. A man well known for his philanthropies, his generous soul, his civic and social services. John Hudson, the uh, real estate Hudson. A friend of yours, I believe, Dr. Hochberg. I didn't recognize him by that description. <laughs> He's uh, definitely interested. Now, it just happens that one of our interns is marrying John Hudson's daughter in a few weeks. Of course, uh, doctor's appointments lie completely in your hands. But we feel that here is an opportunity. We suggest the medical board offer Dr. Ferguson an associateship. 
What? Impossible. He's not ready for the job. Have you any personal prejudice against the boy? Of course not. I think he has promise of becoming a good surgeon someday, but not overnight. He has years of intensive study ahead of him. No man will work for something he can get for nothing. An associate chip now simply means he will go into practice and drop his studies. He would never be worth a tinker's dam as far as medicine is concerned. After all, Dr. Hochberg, that's his concern, not ours. But that boy has unusual ability. But he doesn't know enough yet. He is apt to make mistakes that will hurt not only himself, but St. George's Hospital as well. Oh, come. Come now, Dr. Hochberg. Uh, what do you think, Dr. Gordon? Well, he isn't ready for it, but we could see he was always covered by an older man. And to give him nothing to do? Make a figurehead of him? Fine. Well, uh, Ferguson's not a fool, and we do need Hudson. But, Josh... Uh, Leo, we've got to face facts. The wards upstairs are full now. You want to have to shut them down? Cut back staff? I know, I know. It's a social crime, gentlemen, that hospitals should have to depend on the charity of a few individuals. Oh, really, Dr. Hartberg? Well, fine, fine. We need Hudson. Promise Ferguson an associateship. When he's ready. Uh, when will that be? Five or six years. Yeah. Well, you're dealing with a businessman, not a child. He wants the boy to open an office and settle down. He does. Well, Ferguson will not be ready. He will not accept the appointment. What makes you say that? I know the boy. He is too honest to sacrifice his career for a nice office and an easy practice. Besides, he will not have the time. He's going to work with me. We're wasting time talking about it. As a matter of fact, Dr. Hochberg, I had dinner last night at the Hudson's. I spoke to Ferguson about the appointment, and he is delighted with the idea. He said that? Why not? It's a fine opportunity for him. Well, nothing else, gentlemen? No? Meeting adjourned. <laughs> Dr. McCabe, Dr. Otis, Dr. Bradley. <laughs> <laughs> wow, the prospective bridegroom. How was it, George? Uh, horrible. Any any calls for me? Uh, quite a few. Am I allowed in here? Oh, it's only the library. How was the wedding rehearsal? I'll take spinal anesthesia first. <laughs> <laughs> you better phone in. Cunningham's looking for you. What did you do, kick his mother? Oh, what's the difference? Four more days and I'm an ex-intern. Can I smoke in here? Sure. See you later, George. Miss Hudson? Hmm? You look very high today, George. I worried last night when Mr. Houghton spoke to you about the appointment. I was afraid you might change your mind. Not a chance. I um, just wanted to talk to Dr. Hockberg first. <laughs> Why are you so afraid of hockey? I'm warning you, if you think you can sneak back with him when we come home from Vienna, I'll just drop right out of the picture. He'll probably find someone else. Of course he will. Isn't a man I know wouldn't give his right eye for a chance to work with Dr. Hockberg. Somebody called me? Oh, hi, Hockey. Hello, Laura. That accident case this morning, Ferguson. You gave him a shot of tetanus antitoxin? Michelson took care of it. Where have you been since 12 o'clock? Michelson covered for me. Two hours? But your record is clean only a few more days. George, I heard something this morning. You want to accomplish something in medicine, don't you? Still? Oh, certainly. Laura, you love George, don't you? Well, you know I do. You want to help him, but not this way. That appointment, George, you will not be ready for it. After a year with von Eiselberg, I thought... One year? After all, George has worked so terribly hard till now, Hockey. It's going to make things easier. There are no easy roads in medicine. But if he goes into practice, we'll have some time for ourselves, Hockey. Time? How? There are only 24 hours in a day. He is working with me, and if... Where is he? Are you? I want a little more out of life than just my work. I don't think that's asking too much. I see. I see. So you have decided not to come with me next year. After all, Hockey, we fear we'll be happier that way, and I really well, think... That... Uh -huh. How's your father? Still smokes, I suppose. <laughs> Not when I'm around. But you know, Dad, he usually has his way. Yes. You better get dressed, George. We may have to operate shortly. New cases just come in on surgical service. 
One of our own nurses, uh, what's her name? Uh, oh, that nice little girl up in pediatrics. Uh, 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 yes, Denon, Barbara Denon. You remember her? Oh, yes, yes, I remember her. Yeah. Excellent nurse. Poor oh, child. Such a nice little girl. Sepsis. Is she bad? Temperature 105, blood count way up. What was it, a ruptured appendix? No. Septic abortion. Abortion? Poor oh, girl. Shame, shame. Meet me up there. Uh, George, that accident case is still unconscious. Something the matter with his lower jaw. What? Troturing, somewhat rigid. Thought it might be tetanus. You gave him antitoxin, didn't you? Why, uh, uh no. What? Don't you know yet that T.A.T. is routine in this hospital? Well, yes, sir. Uh, I thought... George, you didn't tell me. I thought you gave it. Dr. Ferguson. I intended to mention it. I, I guess I forgot. Forgot? Is that a thing to forget? It's my fault, Hockey. I dragged him away. We were late. He's not supposed to leave the house at all. And a very sick house, too. Oh, Hockey, it was important. Terribly important. It was a rehearsal of our wedding. That's nice. Nice. Upstairs, there is a boy all smashed up to bits. There would be no wedding for him if he develops tetanus. Dr. Ferguson, inject that antitoxin at once. Yes, sir. Laura, you deserve to be spanked. Don't you know what that boy's work means? Of course I do. No, no, you don't. Would you like to see, perhaps? Yes. Why not? Dr. Michelson. Yes, sir. Take Miss Hudson here upstairs. See that she gets a cap and gown and have her in the operating room in about 20 minutes. Not so good. The temperature? 106. Delirious? She was before she kept calling for you. For me? Yeah. Aggie, get these towels to 401. You better not go in, Doctor. Dr. Hockberg's in there. She's quiet now. If you went in, she might start talking again. I never dreamed this would happen. Well, men don't, usually. Well, why didn't she come to me? Why didn't she tell me? I guess that was my fault. I told her you were in love with someone else and she ought to keep away from you. I didn't know then she'd already Let's gotten see. it. I just thought she realized after that night how crazy we'd both been. Crazy. She's a nurse. I never thought she should have told me. Why did you let her do this? I didn't know till last night. She's just a green kid. She didn't realize what it was all about. Where is that hypo? In a second, Doctor. It's Ryan. Is this Miss Denon a friend of yours? Yeah, in a way. Well, she's a mighty sick girl. You'd better notify her relatives. There aren't any that'd be interested. No? Her friends? She hasn't got anybody. To top it all, she's going to be kicked out of here. Well, they wouldn't do that. Wouldn't they, though? Ask Miss Hackett. And she won't get into any other hospital either. They'll see to that. Poor kid. Yeah. Might just be a lucky break for her if she passed out. She's got to pull through. Why do they go to butchers like that? Doctor, she couldn't have come here. No, she couldn't. What are your findings, Doctor? Sepsis. Better order the operating room at once. Hysterectomy. But if we put her in Fowler's no, position... No, the infection is localized. The only way to save the patient is to remove the focus of infection. Otherwise, she does not have a chance. She was on the children's ward... She loved them. Yes. Yes. Order the operating room. Yes, sir. Operating room. The man. Does he realize what has happened? I suppose so. Hmm. Who is he? I don't know. Operating room. Hello? How soon can we have the OR ready for a hysterectomy? Dr. Hartberg. Yes. Ready now, doctor. <laughs> operating room. Sharp, white, gleaming cleanliness. The corners rounded to prevent accumulation of dust. To one side, the sterilizing room. Polished nickel autoclaves bubbling and steaming. Three nurses, 
One sterile, wearing cap and gown and gloves. Two dirty nurses, no gloves. Dr. Hartberg is on his way up. In the corner, a row of a half dozen sinks. The faucet's turned on with a knee pedal. Over each sink, a sand glass that tells off eight minutes. Oh, I told him it was my night out. I wasn't going to eat hospital food if I could help it. Boy, what a dinner. In the middle, a stand with two basins, blue by chloride and alcohol. Ready in a minute, nurse. Towel. A sterile towel, followed by sterile powder. Gloves, doctor. Tuck in the left. Sorry. At the foot of the operating table, the sterile nurse arranges the instruments, checking twice. Hawkbird using general? Final. In here, Laura. This gown seems awfully wrinkled. I never pressed. That would unsterilize them. George, we have company. Laura. Surprise. Uh, stay away from him. Stand in the corner. You're contaminated. Nurse, see that Miss Hudson gets a mask. Yes, sir. Find a stool for her next to the table. I do not want to, to miss anything. Thanks, Hockey. Don't mention it, Laura. Come on, George. Scrub. Soap and water, bichloride, alcohol, sterile towel, sterile powder, gown, gloves, mask. Orderly, bring the patient in. How is she, Dr. Gordon? George? Yes. What are they going to do to me? There's nothing to be afraid of, Barbara. You won't let them hurt me. No, of course not. Will you be there? George, darling, please be there. I'll be there. Thanks, dear. I loved you. I don't care. Come on. Come on. Careful now. George, what was that all about? Laura, I'm sorry. George, is it what I... Don't touch me. You've spun young sterilized me. Stand over there. The nurse, sterile gown, gloves, towels, quick. Laura, I'm sorry, but... Ready, doctor. Bichloride, alcohol, sterile towel, sterile powder, gown, gloves, mask. Did you have an affair with that girl or what? Yes. Oh, that's a funny one. Dr. Ferguson... Ferguson. Patient is draped and ready. Doctor. All right, I'm coming. Ready, Dr. Gordon? All set. Ferguson. Pulse, respiration, steady. Ready, Dr. Ferguson? Ready. Scalpel. Scalpel. <laughs> something I've got to tell you. I know. Gordon told me. Great field brain surgery for young men. You must think it was pretty low of me. George, I didn't know anything about it until yesterday. I wouldn't have let her. I swear I wouldn't have. It's a bad job. Uh, that poor kid, I, I ought to be shot. Did you force her to have an affair with you? Or did she come to you of her own free will? That has nothing to do with it. That has everything to do with it. Dr. Hartberg, you don't know what she's up against. But I do know. But it's, it's not as though she was just a tramp. She's a fine, sensitive girl. And what a mess I've gotten her into. She can't bear any children. Thrown out of the hospital, nowhere to go. No one to turn to. What's she going to do? Don't worry. We'll find something for her. Just giving her a job isn't going to help her much. 
There's only one decent thing. I'm going to marry her if she'll have me. George, stop talking like an idiot. Pull yourself together. What about Laura? She's through with me, Dr. Hartberg. She knows? She won't even answer the phone. It is too bad. Don't you know, George, in a way, that is not the worst that could have happened to you. Oh, don't say that. You have your work. I'm going to marry that girl. What for? I've got to take care of her, don't I? How? I'm going into practice. George, mid-Victorian idealism won't solve this the problem. The girl is human, isn't she? She needs If me. you think you can provide for both of you just starting practice, then you just don't know. I'll manage somehow. Remember, Levine? I had a letter from him yesterday. Colorado. He's trying to build up a practice. Dr. Hopper, Dr. Jane. They're starting, George. Dr. Hopper. He begs me to lend him $20. At least Levine loved this, Catherine. You don't love this girl. It was an accident, and for that you want to ruin yourself. Fill yourself with bitterness. Live day and night with a woman who will grow to despise you. I've thought of Dr. that. Dr. Hopper, Dr. Hopper. Excuse me. Dr. Hopper. Yes, hello? Oh. Wait for me down. Uh, no, no. Uh. Uh, come up here, room 106, 106. Ask the orderly. I'll wait. Is that Laura? Yes. I, I can't see her now. I can't talk to her. She's so full of fun and life and all the things I've missed for so many years. I kidded myself into thinking I could have that. I, I kidded myself out of the chance of working with you. You still want to? You can. I'm going into practice, I told you. I warn you, George. You will be sorry. You'll be through, finished. All right, then I am. Why not? What good's a profession that can't give you bread and butter after you've sweated out ten years of your life on it? Who needs medicine? I'll find a job at something else. I'll always make a living. Hello, Hockey. Come in, Laura. I just wanted to see you a minute. Alone. Sit down, Laura. Well, you spanked me, all right. I'm washed up with the whole business. I'm sorry you feel so bitter about it, Laura. How did you expect me to feel? I think it was a pretty rotten trick. Stop it, Laura. He had no time for me. He was too busy for me. But he did find time to... That's what hurts, Hockey. It hurts like the devil. Dr. Hopper, Dr. Hopper. I don't care anymore. I don't. That's fine. Then it doesn't make any difference to you that he is throwing his life away. Dr. Hockberg, he's going to marry her, Laura. No. Dr. Hockberg, please. And go into practice and starve and give up his studies. Maybe get out of medicine altogether. The thing he's meant for and worked so... What? Prepare a hypo of caffeine and adrenaline. Long needle. Do you want me? No. No. Stay here. You love her, don't you? I love you, Laura. Yes, I'm sure you do. I don't care whether you believe it or not. Let go. Let, let go of my arm. If you cared for me, how could you do that? I don't know myself, Laura. Everything had gone wrong that day. Six long operations and a battle with Cunningham. I, I lost the patient. The things sort of kept piling up until I thought I'd bust. This kid came to my room with some notes. She was sympathetic and lonely herself and... But after that, I didn't see her around. I just sort of forgot about it. I, I thought it didn't mean anything to her either. But it did, Laura. Now she's up against it. If we'd meant anything at all to each other, you'd have come to me. We quarreled that night. You wouldn't even go out with me. It was that night? Yes. Oh. I didn't want to give up working with hockey, and I didn't want to give you up. I was fighting you and... Through her? Yes. And you say you you loved me? If I hadn't, I'd have called it quits there, Laura. I'd have gone to Vienna and... That's where I was planning to go before I met you. Well, why don't you? Go on. Go on and do it. But you're not. You're going to marry a girl you, you say you don't care for. Well, all right, make your beautiful gestures. You think you're being brave and strong, I suppose. But you're not. You're a coward. It's the easiest way out, because you're afraid people will say things about you. You have no backbone. I had no backbone when I let myself be talked out of a chance to work with hockey. But right now, I have no choice. I'm doing it because that girl's life is smashed, and I'm responsible. 
And I want to try to help her pick up the pieces and put them back together again. <laughs> oh, Laura, don't. I, I knew how you felt about hockey, and I... I shouldn't have insisted. I, I've been so selfish. But it was only because I loved you so much. I still do. I can't help it, George. What is it, Dr. Hartberg? Miss Denham died. What? Oh, no. A few minutes ago, embolism. <laughs> went into collapse. Died instantly. Uh-oh. George. <laughs> Darling. <laughs> Only a few hours ago, she, she was pleading with me for, for a chance to live. Stop it, George. <laughs> Stop torturing yourself. These things happen. Couldn't you do anything, Dr. Hartman? I tried everything. Caffeine intravenously, adrenaline directly into the heart. Useless. A little blood clot in the lung. And we're helpless. Forty years I've spent in medicine. And I couldn't help you. Well, then what's the use? What good is it all? Why go on? It, it takes everything from you, but when you need it most, it leaves you helpless. We don't know anything. We're only guessing. I would not say that, George. We have done some work on embolism, getting some results. Maybe someday, George. Someday. There's not a man in medicine who has not said what you've said. We are groping. We are guessing. But at least our guesses today are closer than they were 20 years ago. That is what we are here for. There's so much to be done. So little time in which to do it. That one life is never long enough. It's not easy for any of us. But in the end, our reward is something richer than simply living. Maybe it is a kind of success the world out there cannot measure. Maybe it's a kind of glory, George. Question is, much as we will. When the test comes, we know. Don't we, George? Yes. We'll reduce that fracture at ten. Schedule the appendix at three. Yes, sir. Oh, darling, I'm so sorry. George? When you come back from Vienna, if Hockey will let you off for a night, give me a ring. I'll be around. Maybe someday we'll get together anyway. Dr. Ferguson. Dr. Ferguson. They're calling you. Yes. Work hard. So long, Laura. Yes, Dr. Ferguson. Who? Oh, oh, Mrs. Gander. Sure. Goodbye, Dr. Ferguson. No, 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 your, your boy's all right. Yes. Now look at you, mustn't cry, Mother. He's all right. We'll fix his leg this morning. He'll be home in a week. Yes. Yes, he's going to live. Now don't cry. He's going to live. just heard the best plays production of Man in White by Sidney Kingsley. Starring Richard Basehart as Dr. Ferguson, with Patricia Wheel as Laura, and Santos Sortega as Dr. Hochberg. And now here's your host, drama critic John Chapman, with a closing word. A well-made play, well-acted, is what we're always hoping for in the theater and don't always get. I think we've had it tonight. Thanks to the author, Sidney Kingsley, and to Richard Basehart and the members of our company. Next week, we're happy to lend our best plays time to an exciting special event in broadcasting. A summary of world events titled End of an Era. The narrator will be Burgess Meredith, 
who has starred several times on our Best Plays series. I should like now to take this opportunity to express the thanks of all of us here on Best Plays for the many letters we have been receiving from one side of the country to the other, from listeners who've told us that they have been enjoying this series of dramas and comedies. Two weeks from now, we will be back with another Best Play. This is Chapman saying goodbye until then. Sidney Kingsley was adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Heard in the cast were Joan Loring as Barbara Denon, Bill Adams as Dr. Gordon, John Sylvester as Michelson, Ann Shepard as Nurse Ryan, Cameron Prudham as Mr. Hudson, John McGovern as Dr. Levine, Ted Osborne as Dr. Cunningham, Matt Crowley as Mr. Houghton, Barbara Karen as Dorothy, Marion Carr as the nurse, and Carl Weber was the narrator. Plays is an NBC production supervised by William Welch and directed by Edward King. Your announcer is Fred Collins. will not be heard next week, but two weeks from tonight. Next week, a special program on NBC starring Burgess Meredith. We would at this time like to take the opportunity to ask those of you listeners who enjoy our best plays productions here on NBC to go to your local bookstore and buy Mr. John Chapman's best plays books published by Dodd Mead and Company. Game to you by transcription. For authentic mystery, tune in Dragnet tonight at 6.30 on NBC. KFI Los Angeles. Ahoy, neighbor. When your dough is getting low like a sink of chip at sea, Seaboard is a friend who'll understand. Yo, people, Seaboard helps you help yourself from catch some terms you choose. Your lending neighbor lends a helping hand. Seaboard, seaboard, seaboard. You know, neighbor, I've found out, and I'll bet you have too, that it's the unexpected expenses that cause the most trouble. Now, if you have a money emergency, take my friendly tip. See your lending neighbor, Seaboard Finance Company. A whale of a problem may become no problem at all, for a seaboard loan may be arranged in record time, and you may have up to two full years to repay. Seaboard likes to help folks help themselves. For cash for any good reason, see Seaboard Finance Company. Thirty-three friendly seaboard offices serve Southern Californians. Consult the phone book for the office in your neighborhood.